digital way to do it. So without further ado, I'll introduce Terry Green here with Think Make Live. I'll let you tell your story, man. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. So I appreciate this opportunity at uh, One Million's Cup uh, for being able to allow me to um, present my organization um, and what I'm doing um, in my career. Uh, first off, my name is uh, Terry Green. I am the founder and executive director of the social enterprise, um, Think Make Live. Um, and so what we do is we're a social justice consulting um, that provides innovation and empowerment to support organizational leaders and opportunity uh, youth. So first off, I want to share my personal story and, and why I am um, doing the work that I do um, inside the community and why I'm involved in community. First off, it started off for me, um, one, um, being born and raised in Toledo, Ohio, um, raised by a great grandmother uh, who is still alive to this day at the age of 87 years old. Um, she raised me from four months into the age of 11 years old. Um, Toledo, Ohio, St. Vincent's Hospital is what, where I was raised and born. Um, and I moved here to Columbus around 11 years old and it was a complete culture shock for me from moving with uh, my great grandmother who went to church every day, um, Monday through Wednesday, Tuesday, Fridays, Sundays and Saturdays, all any day you could think of. She was the lead uh, nurse inside the church to living with my mother here in Columbus, Ohio, who um, was dealing with some challenging circumstances personally, um, meaning that she was dealing with drug addiction, she was dealing with mental health issues, she was dealing with psychological issues, and I was disconnected from my father at the time. My father had remarried, uh, moved on with his life, and started a new family, and paid child support. Um, and so for me, coming from a, a place where I was, you know, a loved child and supported and had so much going on with my great grandmother to come in and living with my mother, like I said, it was a cultural shock. Um, by the age of 15 years old, I was a homeless youth here in Columbus, Ohio. I've been on my own since 15 years old, um, navigating life, um, navigating different systems, um, whether it being um, the uh, school system, the welfare system, uh, many different systems I can say. Um, but for me, my mother got incarcerated um, at the age of 15 um, and I, again disconnected from my father. She didn't want to put us in the foster care system, so we were, me and my little sister, who was 13, um, was couch surfing. Um, living from this house to that house, this couch to that couch. By the time my mother got out of her incarceration, I was 16 years old, working a full-time job, um, living with my friends as a roommate, um, or what they consider some form of gang. Um, I was involved in some friends that show love, that see me as value, right? Um, and they had different challenges and circumstances that they was experiencing themselves, and we all was around the same age. And so for me, uh, I went through a lot of abuse, uh, neglect. Uh, I've been through a lot of trauma um, that, you know, really, um, really changed my perception of what, what life is and what reality is. Um, and, and really, um, for me, 29, uh, 20, excuse me, 2008, I actually watched my best friend lose his life to gun violence um, here in Columbus, Ohio. He was 20 years old, I was 19. I watched him take his last breath at um, Grant Hospital. Six months after that, I was sentenced to serve four years in prison for drug possession and drug trafficking. The judge looked me in my eyes and told me, you are a minister to society, a young black male who has a family who is dealing with drug issues. You're all these different negative labels, affected by the school to prison pipeline, um, and all these different things, right? So at the age of 20 years old, and experiences so much challenging circumstances that I experienced from the transition um, of my grandmother to my mother, and then being in that courtroom and, and, and feeling like, am I a statistic as a young black black male who has experienced poverty, who experienced challenging circumstances. And so for me, I walked inside a prison, I want to do something different with my life. 
I said, listen, I want to change the, the, the trajectory of what my life looks like for the future. Within 90 days, I got my GED and my incarceration. Within 180 days, I was a college student walking on my small business management degree. I walked inside a prison as what the judge called it as a statistics of society, and I walked out breaking statistical barriers. I walked out of prison with over 40 college credits, including five credits from The Ohio State University through a transformational course called the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program, which allows college students to come inside a prison. I walked out inside a prison and I said, I want to do something different. I want to empower some other young people that are, that are experiencing th those challenging circumstances of, of homelessness, of brokenness, of, of dysfunctionalness, uh, of, 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 of having to deal with uh, having a mother that's dealing with challenging circumstances and having a father who's dealing with challenges circles or even living in an impoverished community and so in 2012 uh, I got out six months early to a halfway house and that's why I started my journey um, with this work as a youth mentor and as a motivational speaker through a program called youth build so seven years ago I took the the leaf of faith of coming home from prison and saying that I'm going to dedicate my life to help inspire other young people who are experienced similar stories like mine or are going through similar stories such like right now. And for me, I, I didn't, I never knew that this experience would lead me to becoming an entrepreneur, a business owner, uh, and, and, and being able to connect and um, build so many positive, responsible relationships with people throughout the country. Um, I started this organization, it actually started off as a PowerPoint presentation for a senior humanities class at Ohio State University. In 2015, um, one of my mentors, who is, her name is Dr. Angela Bryan, she gave me the opportunity to come share my story for a senior humanities class at Ohio State University in 2015, and at the time I was homeless again. But this time I wasn't a homeless youth, I was a homeless ex-offender trying to find housing, trying to find jobs, trying to find resources, trying to find support, support, support. But because of having a background and because of what I've done in the past, society wasn't accepting me. And so I found myself living in an in private, I mean, living with my aunt um, in a low-income apartment. Um, I had a car that barely worked, barely drove. Um, I was working at a warehouse job putting stickers on a box and doing forklift all night. Um, and during the day I was doing volunteer service and mentorship for young people. And she said, come tell your story. I said, what story? Hmm. What story? What story do I have to give to value of, of students who come from privileged backgrounds and students that don't even understand where I come from? What stories? She said the story of perseverance and resilience, the story of empowerment, the story of the fact that some of these young people are still, they might not be experiencing the same trauma that you experienced, but, but mental health is going in the same communities. Uh, drug addiction is going in the same communities. Challenging circumstances that you experience is going in the same communities. And then there here is these college students that are empowered to want to do social justice work but all they have is research data uh, and not the real life experience so give them the real life experience and so 2015 I developed this PowerPoint presentation called think make live as a 20 minute PowerPoint presentation how did I think of a change overcoming self-awareness self-doubt to build up self-love self-courage and self-value for myself and understanding that the true value is within my thoughts and then make the change applying myself how do I make it by applying myself to different programs and, and investing my time in, in, in different mentors and different community spaces and then living the change how do you sustain how do you sustain each and every day where I'm 30 years old and I'm still dealing with the issue where a mother is dealing with her challenges, circumstances, and a father is? And I have the moral support and how do you still deal with the, the um, empowerment of yourself, right? Um, and so in 2016, I developed the uh, for-profit um, social justice consulting firm as Think Make Live. Um, my professor empowered me to say that you do a lot of speaking engagements for free. I was doing a lot of speaking engagements before I developed this company, um, just sharing my story for various settings. Um, Multi-million dollar companies, organizations, government agencies that has grants and checks and all this different stuff. And she told me about this one word called honorarium. I said, what is that? Right? And she said, so no one never told you about that, right? And I mean, out of all the speaking engagements you've done, I 
asked them for an honorarium. And that turned into me developing a consulting firm to where I can be able to speak and present, um, share my story, but then also share best practices and strategies around how other organization leaders can be able to support young people like myself. I was a broken young person at 15 years old. You probably not could not even fathom that right now. I was living on crack house floors. I was sleeping in alley. I was I, I was out there, right? And to say that where I'm at now in the transition of my life to be able to empower so many other young people, not here locally, but also around the country. So Think, Make, Live and giving me the opportunity to speak um, all over the country. Uh, I've been just in these past few months, D.C. to Philadelphia, to Rhode Island, to Pennsylvania, um, to Chicago, right? And just sharing my story. And in 2017, I actually developed the nonprofit Think Make Live uh, Youth as an organization to really empower young people between the ages of 10 to uh, 24 years old. So now Think Make Live consists of a social enterprise. At 2015, as a PowerPoint presentation, as a homeless ex offender, is now as a social enterprise with a consulting firm component and a nonprofit organization with a 501c3. Within the past four years, I've started this social enterprise, received my 501c3 status, um, and, and done a lot of, of great work um, within the community locally and also nationally. Uh, and like I said, with the, the consultants, so we do um, many different you know, trainings around um, opportunity youth engagement. So I work with nonprofits now around supporting their efforts, engaging opportunity youth, and what does it look like. Um, I do professional development trainings. Um, I'm actually going to do a professional development training for a local middle school around uh, responsible relationship building and how do they build uh, positive relationships with their young people who is experiencing different tra trauma um, within their community and going home. I also do split presentations where I do um, a keynote speech and then I can do a PD or a, some form of training that, that can add to it. Um, and then the nonprofit side, we have Youth Summit events, which I'll be talking about. Our fourth annual Youth Summit is coming up next Saturday, July the 13th, and there's ways that you can maybe uh, support uh, civic engagement forums, which is a dialogue between um, youth and elective officials and candidates who's running for office. So giving young people the opportunity of a space, of a platform for civic engagement, and see that their voice is matters. Um, and we're in the process of planning our fourth annual civic engagement forum this year. Uh, we also do open mic nights where we have young people who, you know, speak on different open mic settings, um, whether, you know, doing poetry or whether they want to just be able to, you know, just share how they're feeling, their voice. Um, we have a, a space for open mic. And then we have our Columbus Community Action Team, which is our program. And we actually have one of our Columbus Community Action Team youth who's here. Um, and she, I'm going I'm to have her share a little bit about her experience with the, with, with being a part of the, the group um, as a young leader. Um, she is, um, but our community action team, we, um, after receiving my 501c3 status, the organization that's national called Opportunity Youth United, based out in Boston, Massachusetts, they fund um, and help grow local youth coalitions. And these local youth led coalitions identify um, challenges, circumstances in the community, and they create community projects of their own design. Um, and so there's 17 community action teams throughout the country, so it's a, a national thing. Um, you got Chicago, uh, New York, Atlanta, um, I, I can't name them all, but we are the first in Ohio. Um, by us receiving our 501c3, developing a community action team, we received a $15,000 grant from the Aspen Institute and also from Opportunity Youth United in, in conjunction. Um, $15,000 is not a lot of money when you try to develop a program for young people. Uh, I just realized that. <laughs> um, so there was more other things I had to do with funding. But we did receive a grant through the City of Columbus, through the, develop, the Department of Development for $130,000 for this program, uh, 
5,000 for two years. And I'm just telling you this, I haven't even had my 501c3 for a whole year yet. Um, and, I'm, and I'm receiving grants for over $100,000. And I don't know if that's the relationships. I don't know what that is. But I even told them, like, we don't even got no audits. But listen, look, I, I'm telling you, we got the work. And we've been doing this work for four plus years. Uh, me, myself, for seven plus years. And so there, you know, the community is really being supportive of the grassroots that we, we provide. Um, I want to give a success story because without success stories, the work wasn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be what it is. Uh, Deej Dion White, I met him inside of a juvenile correctional facility. So myself, after experience in prison, I now go, I now go back inside of prisons and speak. Uh, I've been in all the juvenile detention centers. I've been in ORW. I've been in a prison where I served my sentence talking to guys who have life sentences that may not never come home. They came up to me and with tears in their eyes and said, you give me hope. You give me hope, you inspire me because what I've been through and being here and being incarcerated since I was 15, 17, 18 years old with a life sentence and to see someone like you to come back inside of an institution to be able to inspire and motivate us and to see what you're doing in the community. I walked inside this juvenile correctional facility and Dion White was sitting right here in the front. I did a two hour leadership development uh, workshop and he said, when I get out of this juvenile detention center, I'm reaching out to you. You're going to help me change my life. Dion White, his father died at the age of nine months. His mother is still living um, in, in, a, in the community. And, um, you know, his story really is empowering because he, he is a motivator. He, he wants to see a shift and a change in his life. And we reconnected um, in 2017. Uh, I was the keynote speaker for an event, and he was receiving a Youth Achievement Award at the same event. So he was receiving an award, and I was the keynote speaker. And since then, he's been involved with my organization. As you can see, he's been spoke on the news. He's the host events. He's the help facilitate events. And I can honestly say I'm proud at the age of 23 years old He's a business owner. He owns his own business. Um, his business is called Close By Roadside Assistance, which is um, a discounted roadside assistance for Central Ohio and the community. I helped him um, get a second, go to the Secretary of State, get his EIN number, go through all that whole process. Um, and at the age of 23 years old, he owns a tow truck. So he actually is in the process of doing some fundraising um, for his tow truck. And I, I'm not about to share most of his story because hopefully he'll be able to do his own once cut. <laughs> He'll do it one of his cups, right? But um, understanding that, you know, this is one of my protégés and this is one of the young people that um, I met inside of the institution. And here it is three years later, I'm watching him change his life by inspiring other young people, but also motivating himself. So our Columbus Community Action Team, let me just give you a little bit about that. So um, it's a 10-month program. Uh, we started it off in February. Those pictures right there is from all our Community Action Team meetings. When I first started doing this work, I I'm just an organizer by heart. I can get people in rooms, young people together. I can, I can just do it. And that's the reason why funders, I guess, like our work and like what we do is because of I started off as just a grassroots organizer and bringing people together. But um, so I don't know if y'all heard of the terminology opportunity youth have anybody is that new for anybody or okay so opportunity youth um, instead of us using the word disconnected at risk all those negative words we use the word as opportunity so to seeing them as an opportunity to get out of their challenges circumstance but being an opportunity that they can be able to thrive and be successful um, in America in statistics say through opportunity index so if you look up opportunityindex.org um, there are data analysis um, group and they say that there is 4.6 Six million young people in America between the ages of 16 to 24 years old who's not working and not in school. And right here in a thriving economy, in an economy like Central Ohio, there's over 20,000 young people between 16 to 24 years old who is not working and not in school right now. Right now in, in this community. Um, and for me, I, I feel like that's a challenge. Right? Well, we have uh, an economic despair. Well, we have a community where there's multi-millionaires living right next to food deserts. We have a community where there's people who's got thriving companies and there's, there's young people that can't get a job because of their background. 
because of what they experienced in the past or because of their, you know, even because sometimes it's because of their name, right? Some companies won't hire a Latasha or Latoya or Deontay, and we experienced this um, doing expert work um, through some survey stuff on a national experience, but taking away different people's names on applications. And, um, but that's the challenge. And so our goal is how can we reduce this 20,000? With our small organization, I know we can't do it all, right? Um, so building partnerships, building collaborations around other nonprofits who's already doing this work is our goal is to reduce this 20,000. Um, and, and the way we do it is connecting young people to different opportunities, being involved inside our community action team, um, and then providing a, a state of opportunity report to legislators stating that this is, you know, how many young people we have reconnected um, and we're helping reducing this number um, and understanding the advocacy piece. Um, and so our topics is mental health, uh, financial literacy, in the school to prison pipeline, um, community and civic engagement, um, and you know recruiting 100 young people is our goal. And um, I'm just excited to definitely be doing this work. Uh, Stacia has been a part of the community action team. Um, tell them a little bit about just you know just you being a part of the community action team. How yeah, long so you've been a part? I've been a part of this since January, the beginning of this year. And it's just been an amazing experience. I've already been able to travel to California, which I've never been to before, for a national youth summit. Um, there were so many powerful youth that I got to meet there. Um, a lot of connections, just to see a lot of youth, what they're doing in their communities. It was really awesome to see that. Um, I actually got to do a lot of networking events and get to mentor with the youth. Um, the topics, financial literacy, I really love that because um, I do forex trading, cryptocurrency, so I want to empower the youth to start investing at a young age and not waiting until like 30s and 40s because it's about now, you know, and changing their lives now, making that change now. So I've been just, I got, I got a big vision, but yeah, I love being a part of this and what this stands for. Yeah. Yeah, and so, and, and, and like she said, um, California, so another thing is us being in partnership with Opportunity Youth United, we, um, uh, they actually pay for young people to go to trips. So I took um, three of my young people so far this year, we took three young people to Chicago for a youth summit retreat. Um, Stacia went to California to Facebook Foundation, the Facebook headquarters. She was at the headquarters of Facebook for the State of Opportunity Youth, and the State of Young People event that they have um, all over the country. I'm actually taking two more young people to Denver, Colorado, um, August the 27th through the 28th. All expenses is paid for through Opportunity Youth United. So it gives young people an opportunity not only to be able to be local leaders, but then they can be able to travel, experience the country, but then learn from other young people best practices around what they're doing to engage their peers as a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, as a peer-to-peer -peer support of advocacy, community engagement, leadership development within their community. Um, and so here's some of our partners, uh, sponsors that we have that's supporting us. Um, Average Joe's, Red Door Barbecue, the Department of Development, of course the Urban Entrepreneur Center, um, Impact Community Action, uh, 10 TV is our media sponsor for our events. Um, they actually sponsor in this one, um, Radio One uh, with Yavez, um, the Care Coalition, which is through um, Columbus Public Health, um, Diversify Systems, um, and these are just some of the ones that we have so far with this uh, with the community action team. Um, so my call to action, I guess my how can you help us is uh, one, you know, if you know any people that, you know, could potentially be a sponsor or be a partner in this work um, to be able to support our community action team um, in, in the work that we're, we're doing. We mobilize young people. Um, we have this grant for two years, so we know we're funded for two years with the City of Columbus, um, but the $65,000 that we have for the City of Columbus for two years is not 
enough, right? It's not enough to, to be able to over, do what we're trying to do in terms of helping young people. Um, become a speaker for our community action team. So our community action team, we have monthly sessions, and we're always looking for um, speakers to sp speak on specific topics, whether mental health, whether financial literacy, community or civic engagement. We're always looking for um, presenters to come and provide some great education to our young people. Um, and then our fourth annual youth summit so the flyers you have we've been hosting this event for four years here in columbus ohio um, i'm excited that we're on our fourth annual youth summit event um, to be able to um, connect young people to resources to be able to have positive workshops um, there's a way to be able to support whether donating to the event um, whether um, ha knowing someone who we have vendor table space available so if you know somebody want to provide a vendor uh, whether employment opportunity some form of resource um, to, to, to the young people um, and then last book me for a speaking engagement I've always tried to get uh, more different speaking engagements and put myself in um, different platforms to be able to share um, not only my experience but then also share my expertise around the work that I'm doing um, and then the last thing I want to speak about before the Q&A is um, social justice awards so I um, I put a, around a little bit of the hot cards of the Social Justice Awards. So um, shout out to my mentor, C. Sunny Martin, who's in the back. Um, I, I definitely, and I thank, um, you know, I thank God for being able to place him in my life. Um, I actually met Sonny walking down the street um, in his, where his, his daughter was living at. And uh, I was passing out a flyer for a Stop the Violence event. And he pushed me, uh, he like basically said, get off my porch, who is this young guy coming up with these tattoos on his back? <laughs> right, he profiled me to, to the T. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get my picture. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I mean, that, that encounter was like, Dispatch did an article on us called a, a Chance Encounter. But that Chance Encounter truly inspired me as an entrepreneur um, and as a business owner. He, um, we, when we first met, that little two minute conversation I thought was going to give a hot car turned into a two hour mentor session. That is, he's been mentoring me for the past two and a half years um, and supporting me in the development of my organization and even helping me be able to get established here in the Urban Entrepreneur Center. And I truly appreciate him. But uh, last year, me and him was at Wendy's and we were sitting down and this concept of the Social Justice Awards came about. Um, here in Central Ohio, the first national social justice park has, uh, has been built, which is a moral of, of social justice leaders um, throughout the 1800s, and that's on Broad and Cleveland. If you've never seen it or never been there, please go. Um, and we had the discussion, it's like, wow, Central Ohio has the first social justice park. What about creating an event to be able to honor social justice warriors, leaders, and those unsung heroes and sheroes? And so um, I bought the domain got the uh, logo, got everything together, and less than six months I founded and created the Social Justice Awards, um, which is a ceremony to honor social justice leadership um, through uh, whether it be law enforcement, legal advocacy, uh, public service, restorative justice, uh, education <coughs> advocacy, and community service. We put together an event with over 320 people within the first event. I mean, people was talking about this event for a month straight. I mean, there was people oh, yeah. that was, wasn't right people wasn't even at the event. I had seven judges there. I had city council there. Um, I had many different elective officials, um, constituency um, that was there. And, and actually, an article was written. Um, and in that article, he said, um, and I think it was through the pastor, um, Reverend Tim Ayers, um, First Congressional Church. He said that um, that was the first time of him living here in 30 years where you brought preachers, you brought judges, you brought police officers, ex-offenders, community and youth in one room together. Um, to be able to honor um, positive people in the community. So 2020 Social Justice Awards is in the planning and it works uh, and definitely would love for you guys to maybe potentially be involved. Uh, I appreciate One's Cups for this opportunity to be able to share Think Make Live um, social enterprise and the work that we're doing um, and open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to Q&A, again, I'm very, very respectful of everyone's time. But uh, I do want to say I asked 
Terry, if you would just elaborate a little more. I know it's a departure from our six-minute uh, presentation portion, but I, as you can tell, I mean, my God, there's so much emotion and history here. It really just needs to let the story flow. So I appreciate your, your patience and listening. I know everyone felt it as much as I did. Uh, again, sensitive to your time, so if you have to go, we understand. But by all means, there's no rush. Please hang out, ask as many questions as you want. And there's, there's no limitation how long we can be here. So. Anybody, uh, you usually go Mike to, to give the floor. <laughs> have that. So we have the first question right here. Please just, you know, do the hand thing and give attention. Where did the name Nani come from? Nooney. Oh, <laughs> Nooney. My mom. So my mom named me that when I was, I was little. Um, and what you go by? Yeah, well, the, you can't. You can call me by duty if you want to. <laughs> I mean, as I got older, as I, as I got older, I embraced it more because it's my different. My dad's name is Terry Green, um, and so as I got a little older, I started to embrace Nooney. <laughs> I have a cousin who would call Nooney because the all payouts are. Well, the stats on the twenty thousand. If nothing is done, how many will end up in prison? Uh, I, I I don't know that question. That's that's a good question. Is it probably is a high percentage? It really is, um, because a lot of our young people that's um, in that twenty thousand have experienced whether homelessness, foster care system, right, um, or even been adjudicated in some type of way, right? Um, so our goal is to do prevention. We're actually in the process of developing a partnership with community and schools to provide some um, prevention inside of schools um, and also Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority to provide some intervention at their local resident sites. So prevention is something we're definitely, um, we're definitely all about, um, definitely. What, what struck me, uh, particularly, just really kind of shattered me. When I met him, uh, like so many other people, you know, we have uh, preconceived notions and we tend to judge people. And here I am. I, I, I grew up in Coles, Ohio, literally not far from here down the street. Uh, single parent mother, uh, living in a half house duplex. And, you know, I made it in life. I, I owned a business in 27 cities, became a millionaire, had a million dollar business. And, 27 cities, and I said, so many of us African Americans are looking at these kids in, in the hood, and we're prejudging them because they're not our kids. You know, when you look at uh, 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 the statistics, you know, 50% of them in metro areas all across the country are not graduating from high school, so they're not they're not employable. Uh, Jamie Diamond did a study from McKinsey and Company, and said 70% of them are not even eligible for the military because of low reading writing scores and also health and diabetes uh, uh, health issues. So I just took it upon myself. I sold my company in 2009 and I was really trying to tune into what God wanted me to do in the last chapter of my life. And I said, it would be a shame for me to not a college graduate, coming out of the hood, not to reach back and pour into some of these young underserved kids and be able to mentor them. Uh, you know, Terry's, when he told me his story, I'm going like, wow. You know, when you think you have a bad mom, I said, there's always somebody got 10 times worse. Than you. We were poor. I mean, we were, we were really, really poor. Uh, but, you know, I was able to make it. And I said, you know, there's so many more of us that can do so much more. I mean, what I see, what he's done with his life, and first of all, let, let's, let's be clear, he was a thirsty learner. You can lead a horse in water, but you can't make a ball train, all right? But I was just blessed that God brought us together. And what I've seen him done, and he's, he's really not really told you a lot of things. I mean, when he gave a talk at Harvard University, Emory University, he's on stage with Eric Holder, the former uh, attorney general for the United States, and I'm looking at him when I saw him walking down the street <laughs> trying to hand me a flyer. And uh, I didn't want nothing to do with him, you know. I'm back to my daughter's house. She's, you know, school teacher. She's in L.A. I'm on the grass. And me and the next one there, we're just talking about all these young men during the summertime, during the day, not doing nothing, just hanging out. And that wasn't, that wasn't my life. I'm on the grass, 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 I'm on and what he's poured back into the community. Yeah. And it's that little 
pebble that's thrown in the pond and the ripples are going everywhere. Yeah. All over the country. Yeah. Yeah, because so I mean, I, like I you said. Thank you guys for, for showing up and listening to the story. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, I mean, it could be easily, after you experience so much in your life, you can be easily saying that you just, you give up, right? Or you you trying to find so much ways to to uplift yourself. But for me, I, I, I devoted my time into helping others. Um, I devoted my time into service. So I kind of had a brief idea for your youth program. Okay. Um, so in college, I was on the debate team. Uh-huh. And there, we... We volunteer with high schoolers, but uh -huh. there, there's also, like, even in disadvantaged youth and juvenile detention centers, they have debate teams. Right. And they're, they're trying to start debate programs. Okay. Maybe you saw in 2015, a Har um, the Harvard debate team lost to a, a group of prisoners. Okay. It's, and it's uh, yeah, yeah, it sure is. Yeah, 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 it was a big deal. And uh, I think it's a great way for people to just get learn. Not like, even if they can't, it helps with because yep. you have to learn political science, philosophy, so regular like science, all these different cross embodied, uh, all these different cross class yep. concepts go into debate. Okay. You get good at that. You can it helps your college, it helps GED if you need that. It right. helps just learning about society and the political atmosphere we live in. Yeah. So it helps a lot with just life skills in general if just to learn the concepts. Yeah. So if you, I'm sure you have the hood debate team. The hood debate team. Oh, yes, it's supposed to be a good team. They've always had a good team. Okay. So you can get them to volunteer with your kids or just teach them the basics. Okay. Yeah, and I never really thought about that because, you know, civic engagement is definitely one of the strong components when it comes to our organization in Rooted um, just because of I started this work too in, in, as 2012 2013 is doing a lot of advocacy on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. through Youth Bill and trying to get the even appropriation later. So I'm just thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. Even if you can't just. Uh, tournaments can get expensive, and even just like practice rounds between people. Yeah, on, yeah, on yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it helps with confidence, it helps with a lot of things, and I think <laughs> it would be beneficial to people, especially youth who, who are smart but don't have the circumstances. Okay. To, to necessarily be on a team like that. And you can get scholarships to good colleges. Okay. Also, I like if, that. If you get really well, good, you can get a good scholarship. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I thought that would be an interesting way to go. Terry, what reach out in the corporate community have you done for funding for resources? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so. Be straight. None? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have, I have the book of lists, <laughs> so I've, I've reached out to people. I've, I have some interns that's been working with me um, in terms of um, okay. generally building meetings up from, from clients that way. But um, do you have any ideas or thoughts? No, I just moved here three months ago. <laughs> I'm, I'm a networker. So. Okay. Um, and I've been to a couple of networking events. So have you been to Chris Borey's networking events? Well, I was there um, last night. Yep. He knows yeah. he's, he's yeah. Yep. So I've some been. Some people are a little. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not like, people are like really genuine and really great people, but then you always meet that quack that's trying to sell you stuff out of their company. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's another networking group that's really prestigious that I just got um, familiar with, and it's called BNI. Um, have you heard of BNI? So the chapters um, where you go and you kind of sit down and they do the referrals and stuff like that. So I, I sat in one of those. And I'm actually going to sit in one next week. And so um, those generally kind of things that, that I've been doing in terms of, you know. Terry needs a strong business development person that can, you know, yeah. hit the corporate, you know, yeah. rounds in, in the community. That's what he really needs. And yeah. he just threw this grant. He hasn't even gotten the money from the city grant yet. But through that grant, he's able to hire people, so he's going to have his first employee uh, within a month or so. Yeah, yeah. He gets the money from the grant. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the infrastructure of what we try to help him get to, to, to this level uh, and bring people around him and create the social justice awards. Uh, he's got the advocacy within the city government. Uh, 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 the, the governor's office is, is, is going to look favorable. To oh, yeah, know, yeah, Mike DeWine's on, office. On, 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 Pretty sizable grant. And that's a, um, 
capacity building grant. So I, I'm, when it comes to grants, we then I just got a you know a grant opportunity last night to do an event with American Promise for thirty thousand dollars. So we can do grants, but that's the thing is I'm I'm where you at. How do I? tap into the corporate community um, and who do I need as my allies to be able to help me to get into the to that to that space not only one just to be able to get sponsorships but two to be able to provide opportunities for our young people right um, to be able to see our young people as you know these potential you know organizational leaders that can be able to have you know some form of employment opportunity so definitely is, that's something I'm thinking about he had one back here I know he was asking uh, yeah, you have a board yeah, so we do have a board, um, and I'm actually in the transition of my board right now. Um, there's a couple of things that I'm I'm doing. There's some board members that um, transition, yeah. transitioning transition. off. Yeah, <laughs> just some transition. Well, I, I work with lots of boards, uh, directions for youth and family, and okay. kind of the launch pad for a lot of things. But I've noticed there's been a dearth of funding though for things like summer youth programs, which would be ideal, I mean, where you'd be able to take or apply for contract with the Workforce Development Board, at least that's the way it used to work, and you might have a class of 16 to 20 youth to inculcate them with these same things. They've kind of pulled those things back, they're focusing on smart city and all that. I, I've challenged them because, you know, smart cars, yeah, they're thing of the future, but poverty is reality today. And those monies were really uh, instrumental in things like welfare to work helping folks get off of welfare. I mentioned to Sonny that Governor, well, I don't know if I did. Uh, years ago, Governor Voinovich saw that he had like a $600 million surplus of unspent welfare money. He put it out on the street for pro projects to address poverty and the like. So we did, we had a two-year contract working with dropout, I mean, no, actually we are working with welfare families. Where we are in Northeast Columbus, there are no services. So these folks stood to lose their benefits if they weren't in some meaningful activity. Yeah. So since we didn't have a settlement house like St. Stephen's, we didn't have any programming out. We were above St. Stephen's, so we're not in Linden. So we created this little program called Navigating Your Own Future. Okay. Frank Amaro. It's not a lecture. It's a metaphor for life. Yeah. I mean, you're, what you're doing is negotiating your life by learning these things and what the rules are today. Mm -hmm. And so we trained over 120 youth with that program. We did the same thing with adults on you know, welfare to work. Okay. Uh, we gave the contract to Kamako because I wanted them to take it because that was their mission. Right. We run a separate nonprofit, CDC. We were, this was kind of an adjunct to the housing that we've done in Northeast. Okay. Uh, they took the program over. They ran it for about two years before the governor pulled the money back. The reason I mention this. Right now, Governor DeWine has a $400 million welfare surplus. I would suggest the same thing. 400 million. 400 million. 400 million. Yes. And, and, and he should recall the original program. But to me, it was a marvelous way to empower local communities there with practical solutions. We talk about getting people off of welfare. Yeah. We don't know what the barriers are. Right? Yeah. Transportation is a real barrier. Yeah. We don't need smart buses. If there's no service that will take them to these jobs, yep. the jobs aren't in Columbus. Right. They're outside New Albany. Yep. All of our suburbs are cities. Yep. So they have all those jobs that inner city folks need because they can't access them here. Right. But they can't get a bus out there either. Right, right. And so while they're fighting for a, a nice rail system to bring people from there in, that reality is, to me, doesn't do a benefit to you and me as a taxpayer. When we know that we have our families in need of access to those very real jobs. Yeah. When we did this project, working with John Gregory, with residents over at Greenbrier, yeah. uh, Morsi used to coordinate a Department of Transportation program where they would provide a van, they would lease vehicles to work groups. And we were able to get people to those jobs in the south end of Columbus. And so, to me, it's doable, it's the buy in. But I find the agencies have all retreated. Uh, they're not wanting to do direct service. They like doing projects, which yeah. means there's no commitment. And for you to get sustainable, you need that kind of like a steady line there that buys into your mission. Yeah. So then if you start attracting more private yeah. donors and the like, that it may be sustainable. Yeah. But for the most part, they're not in it. I yeah. can tell you, after almost 40 years of working with nonprofits in Northeast, that we've done things in spite of that right. hurdle. 
But right. knowing as I watch what the city does, it's, I'm critical. I'm, I got my master's in public policy at Ohio State, which just helped sharpen the tools I had. But, yeah. but I work with state government. I work for the housing authority. So I know all the players. Yeah. And so they need to put more skin in the game. And I think you're you're the kind of vehicle right. that they should. Right. They have to be oversold before yeah. they you know, let loose the dollar. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, 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 I appreciate you yeah, definitely for sharing that. And speaking of the Workforce Development Board, I'm actually in conversation with uh, Lawrence Jackson, who is overseeing um, the youth component. He actually came to one of our meetings. Um, but one thing that I'm trying to think, even with my organization, and maybe y'all can probably help me get some thought ideas around this, but I'm trying to move away from all the restricted funds and thinking about how do I get to unrestricted funds and how do I get to building a social enterprise component where we bring in our own revenue, where we're not supporting, we're not have to going to get these grants and we got to keep knocking on these doors to fill out these long applications and go through all these different reports but what we can be able to have a component and this is something me and Sonny talk about whether a youth lawn care service whether having a youth uh, food truck uh, whether having right. some component, yeah. component yeah. of a business well I'm not I'm not and, and I appreciate the I appreciate the government I appreciate that but I'm, I'm just saying it, it becomes so many different challenges we're trying to go through those systems but if we had a component well we're in two things about this is what I'm understanding is that you go to investors and you tell investors because it's different from going into investors and telling an investor that we got this program where we need grant funding but we have this business model that's going to have an ROI for you yeah. right where you're going to see an ROI on your investment where then you then that's the being able to support so those are the things that I've been thinking about is like and going into next year in 2020 is what can I add on to this organization what can I add on that can bring in us that cash flow revenue right Right, well, we got all these young people. I got 20,000 young people that's seeking a job. If Think Make Live is the hub that has the jobs, right? You know. I don't care if service and food. I mean, what you just said to me is is the secret because Think Make Live can translate into ideas becoming reality, which is sustainability. Yeah. I mean, if you take those three words, that it, it is your model. Yeah. The the reality of grants is that they build your dependency and not your capacity. Yep. Yeah. And so if you want to live in a grant world, you can have a grant writer and write grants from now until your organization dies off. Right. Right, because that's what will happen. So I think that what you have talked about with the transition of your board, you're talking about how do I get involved with corporations. It's through the partnership. Yeah. The partnership is where that money, is where all of those leaders come together in yeah. Columbus. And so I'm going to make some introductions for you. Okay. But the reality is right now, the partnership has a huge focus on education. Okay. And so they think that education is how they're going to change the city of Columbus. Mm. So connecting you with the with Columbus City Schools okay. right, is another piece of that. Okay. And then the third piece, obviously, is just helping you to, to get into the, get meet some of those leaders in the community that you might want on your board because that's where you're going to get the corporate money from. Right, yeah. right. Which will then give you the seed money to do the ideation that you want to do. Right. To come up with the programs that are going to, that right. are going to be able to demonstrate both prevention and intervention. Right. That's what you're doing. Yep. Prevention and intervention. Intervention, yep, both of them. Yep. I appreciate you for that. I've got to go. Let me say this on that. It's not either or regarding public money. They can be both. To do what you want to do. Some of the things that, you do, that you're doing with these folks, the money is there to do it. The people that get the money currently don't have the passion that you have yep. to make it work. Yep. So to me, it's being socially entrepreneur. If you pursue those, yep. those kinds of core things that kids need. Yeah. Because you're, you're not going to be a school, but why wouldn't you be? Right. You could start to a charter school, yep. you're, which would be a, a social entrepreneur <coughs> school right. doing all of that. So it means you go one way there, but that doesn't stop you from getting private money. Oh, yeah, getting yeah. private money is people seeing you with succeeding in any of these things and say, look, this is what I produce. Uh, these are people, workers for your company. These yeah. are, uh, and so when you get their attention then, then you can free that capital. Because unless you get to those big check writers, it's a long haul to get there. Right. And I just say that they're almost hostile to to nonprofits anyway doing the social piece anymore. Yep. So they've kind of collapsed who can get the money. So right. That's the real problem. Yep. But the money is earmarked for the very families that you're serving. Right. And they're less interested in that dynamic than they are just turning it around and getting nice bureaucratic jobs. I'll, I'll tell you that after working 
20-some years with bureaucracies within and another 20-some years out to see that they, the same lethargic group is still controlling it yeah. and are creating a little a cartel and dictating who does get the yeah. money. Yeah. So you have an idea that has merit for them. Uh, the only good thing you have political right now, so the more you build it, maybe those folks will open that can of worms. Otherwise, yeah. they have resisted these ideas only because their friends weren't the ones doing right, it. Right, right. So we'll have a nice private yeah. chat, but yeah. you need to know the character behind all these things, yeah. how they've treated nonprofits over the last 40 yeah. years, and ignored investing in yeah. things like this, but don't invest in folly or helping other people. And and I, I know you gotta go, but that kind of, you know, that kind of was something that was came about too. One, one of the funders, well, um, through the uh, Workforce Development Board, he actually sat through one of our presentations, and one of the things that he said too is that here we are funding all these nonprofits organizations who have all this years and years of history, but they they got all this money for getting young people, but they can't get one picture like this. They can't get one picture to show us that we that y'all that we have y'all that we funding y'all groups of young people, right? They can't get I'm the, glad the people. Give you some insight on that. Yeah. yeah, we met with uh, we met with Franklin County Commissioner building a four hundred million dollar new county jail. Yeah, four hundred million dollars. Now we know who the occupants of that county jail is going to be, but the majority of we asked for fifty thousand dollars. You know, to help be able to train young folks to be more entrepreneurial, this, that, and the other, and we didn't get any return phone calls. <laughs> no, That's your camera. Yeah. 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 All right, thank you, brother man. Okay. Yeah, but I got your car, and I'm sending you an email so we can sit down and get a cup of coffee. Sure. So, okay. Experience here, because they they just mowed down a lot of good people, and people get frustrated as to why why can't I get support for the work I'm doing? Yeah. So I've just seen too many people starved out. Uh, our church has been the backbone for part of what we do. We, we sponsor furniture bank appointments. Now, you think, well, what's that? A lot of people, we've had 18,000 evictions last year. That means a lot of families are out in the street. They lost all their furniture or half of it. They couldn't hire a U-Haul. They just barely got out of the place. Mm -hmm. Nobody's answering that challenge. I met with Legal Aid a couple of months ago. Uh, I asked them to kind of study that because there's, and people like the Housing Authority are perpetrators of part of the same issue, too. And with a diminished supply, they're not the answer for the problem either. Yeah. So again, it's, it's kind of starving people, and starving people who can work with people who understand it, and it feeds their friends. I know people that ran an enterprise for 17 years that was supposed to help. CDCs like us, they don't, they don't even show a production record of producing any housing. Yeah. We have produced 1,400 units of housing without their help because they tried to starve us to death by being bureaucratic. Talk to Steve Torcell out on the far west side, the efforts he's been doing out there for 25 years. If you don't play with the people that they want to invest in, they won't let you have the opportunity to develop family housing, senior housing, and the like. So this goes on in all kind of ways. So I'd be glad to give you the yeah. backdrop of that because there, there are only a few survivors. I can show you a list. At one time, there were about 36 of us doing this in all these neighborhoods. I'm one of only three or three or four that was, you know, able to survive doing things in spite of these folks saying they're here to help you. So, you know what the biggest lie is? I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, can you take you can say. you take some of these flyers for your church? Uh, yes. And you work with uh, you Bill Holland? Stack. Huh? You Just to Bill give him the whole Holland? stack. No. no, who's that? <laughs> um, He's an ex thug. He wrote a book called. Oh, uh, Thel, Thel Robinson. Robinson. Thel Robinson, a thug yeah. is a dog. Yes. I'm <laughs> trying to help him because he's got this center up in, in Linden. Because to me, the problem is that things aren't out where the people are. So, right, right. Uh, if you come downtown, maybe you get some help or get told you can find help. But it's not vested in neighborhoods. Right. And so right. there are other neighborhoods besides Linden. They haven't realized that after 40 years of going over there and not having any real success. So. Yeah. I'm well, not thank a you. Panic. I'm an analyst. Uh, I'll give you the whole story. <laughs> All right. So I'll see you with Scott. Yeah, yeah, on Monday. Yeah. Monday. I'll be back. Um, I'm Angry. Thank you. I'm Angry. 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 I'm Ang
pay out of the It's how to create socially minded for profit businesses, essentially. And what's that called? Where is that at? It's at my university, Lynn University in South Florida. But I can get you in touch with the guy who runs it. Okay. And make fun of everybody, and I know. Yeah, him. yeah. So I can give you his information, and he can probably give you some good feedback on how to turn the your idea into a for profit business for social change. That's what okay. we've been working with him here for. Yeah. He, he's actually attending in this building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we uh, have, uh, it's a whole concept that they're training people at my university to create these sorts of businesses. Okay. Yeah. Um, so did you got my did you get my card? Not yet, but I So this right should be yeah. yeah. And, uh, so I'll, I'll email you that. But um I need a couple other little ideas. I know college is really expensive, and a lot of people in the inner city don't have access to it. So, have you tried like getting trade schools and trade programs to come talk to your youth? Because that's a very respectable business to be in, and people don't often overlook it because they don't feel like it is not a college like program. Yeah. So, I think that might be interesting to like bring trade school and trade professionals like plumbers, electricians, all these people to come in and talk, talk to, to you. Talk to you. Yep, 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 yep. A lot of days in modern society, it's so much pressure to go to college, and it's so expensive. You yep. might take out like, 100000 in debt when you can, for $1,000, get a trade degree. Right. I agree with that, because I didn't go to college, and I work at a dental office, and I did dental assisting and still in get junior and some senior year, some pay. Yeah. yeah, making close to what a hygienist would be making, so without a college degree. So and yeah. you just got a promotion, too. Yeah, they just got a promotion. <laughs> so I feel like that's a good way to, like, Get someone a have a positive message in the community. Like there is other options besides going to college. Right, right. A lot of people I know either feel like it's college or like selling drugs or something. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, there's a lot more in between than that. Right. And also internships. You're uh, so you do uh, social engagement and community service nonprofits like stuff. So when I was in high school, I did internships with JFS, Jewish Family Services. Yeah. They didn't pay me, but I sat there. I'd, I've been working. I helped with projects and stuff. And I, when I went to college, I had a job on my resume because I had that internship in, in high school that I worked a couple days a week during the summers. I got so many jobs because of that. Well, because I had that experience. I wasn't yeah. just some out of. High I got school. a couple of interns I'm working with right now. So from like, okay. you're, you're coming in like talking with other nonprofits and getting them in the sphere they're interested in. Yeah. Whether that be, I don't know. Uh, Habitat for Humanity, or just something where they can help do something to get a, a, a something on their resume. Okay. Because that's a, always a big thing for youth, especially now. They always want so much experience when they're young. Well. And you could work at McDonald's, but you could also do an internship in an office, and that looks better to people. And this is a judgmental thing, but yeah. it's what people tend to go toward is the person who has an office experience. Experience, yeah, right, sounds good. So those are just things I would, I see that would be, I don't know if you're doing them now, but they could Yeah, we do got some interns. You, I believe in interns. I've been having interns since I started. I just think that if you turn through the yeah. nonprofits, it'd be helpful to like give them a yeah. different So yeah. it's also advertises for your business yeah. and helps your clients. Yep, 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 yep. And that's one thing that we started off too is having um, a collaborative uh, com uh, approach. Is um, so when I first received the grant from the city of Columbus, I knew I couldn't put, I couldn't produce twenty thousand young people by myself as a small startup nonprofit. And so what I did is I invited um, other nonprofit leaders, um, private public, different sectors that are um, willing to support Opportunity Youth. We had about 26 organizations who came out um, and we hosted that um, in December and then we just hosted one again um, in June. And so the one we had in June was at um, public come uh, excuse me, Columbus Public Health. So understanding too is that what is our niche? What do we what do we provide? Um, my thing is, and my and not, this is just my vision. My vision is I want Think Make Live is to be the hub to to connect young people to one the, the leadership development, but employment opportunities to dis, to get them from being disconnected, right? And that's gonna definitely be the program. With like so, like your youth who are in high school, yeah, if they. So I know a lot of people struggle with grades and GPA and all that. If they, or even attendance, so like come with an incentive program. Like if you get perfect attendance for this month, I will give you $150 in scholarship toward whatever program you want to go to after high school. But mm. like come with some sort of incentive program for grades. Like if you get 
like a 3.0 GPA, you get this amount of money towards a scholarship for after high school for for programs either I like that. or college or something because that might be a good incentive. Yeah. I like that. I think. I think we're sitting here brainstorming ideas, and I don't think you're short on ideas. No. So, uh, so I guess I just I, need the resources and the people. Say is, you know, uh, I would say also Columbus State. If you haven't met the president of Columbus State, he said to me, "It's our moral imperative to close the gap between kids who have access to college and kids who don't." Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of people I would I would want you to meet. Yeah. Because what they're saying is, we share a vision. Right? Right. We share a vision for a world that currently doesn't exist, but let's create it. Yes. Yes. So to me. I think the only thing that stands between you and that is ha being in the room with those people. Yep. And so I think that, like, I'd like to is the exposure. talk to you because we yeah. like to just figure out some strategic introductions. Yeah. And when those, like, when you do those and you do whatever you want with those, yeah. then we'll make some more, right? Okay. Um, because I think that that's the thing. You're talking about building a world that doesn't exist. Yep. And so... That might, might happen through all of these little tiny initiatives, but mostly it's going to happen because of the ideas that you already have in place. Yes. Like, how do we engage a community? How right. do we engage young people? Yep. How do we engage schools to think about this? Yep. I mean, if we're talking about, he, he talked about eviction. Eviction is yep. the number one reason people become homeless in Columbus. Yep. The second being about abusive relationships. Right. So if we're going to talk about that, then we have to talk about, well, wait a second. Why is it that people are being evicted? Right, right, right. right. We're, that's the outcome. Yeah, but what are the big outcomes that happen? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. economics. Well, well, we well, well, got to well. disrupt the status yeah. quo. Yeah. What we got in yeah. ushering <coughs> new uh, formative ways to be able to create businesses in the inner city, show people business ownership, success, and opportunities, and lead them into best practices and own business. Everybody owns business in our communities but us. And the, the statistics tell you, uh, the policy report came out 50 years Martin Luther King passed, I mean, from being assassinated, that the African American community in the United States is worse off now than it was 50 years ago. And a major part of that is economics. Economics, economics, economics. Everybody in America has a higher percentage, every race uh, group in America has a higher percentage of business ownership than the African American race. And you know, that's why I was you know put together three partners and we opened up the center. We're teaching entrepreneurship, business ownership as a way to be able to to to, to help uh, 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 you know reduce poverty. I mean I met him that year I met him seven hundred and fifty bucks for a whole year working ten dollars an hour in the warehouse. Last year almost a hundred grand. All right. This year probably being, you know, double that. You know, so he's been able to affect other people, sure. inspire them to start their businesses because they see his success. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, success leads to And, and I, think, I think that the challenge that you have is filtering it down to what your organization is. Yeah. Because everybody has their own yep. thing, right? Yeah. I mean, you have what you're trying to do here, yep. right? And if you work with the schools, they have what they're trying to do. Yep. You have to figure your out niche. what your intersection is. Yep. Yep. Because your intersection isn't what everybody else's is. Right. And otherwise, you wouldn't have a business because they'd be already doing it. Right. 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 So I think you've got to figure out what your intersection is. I think you have. I'm, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think you've got to figure out how to say to everyone who wants to be involved. Right. right. This is the part that I do. Right. Right. It will also positively impact what you do. Yep. Right. That's what people are going to care about. That's but the win-win. I, I think the challenge is not to get sucked into everybody else's mission so that it becomes yours, because then yours is going to sit there while right theirs is going to thrive. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. He just got to scale what he's doing. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you for your time, and I know that yeah. this this is a good conversation. You have any thoughts or ideas, uh, brother man? I was just I was flying all listening. Um, so I was I was curious about the uh, the vision, which you kind of explained there. Yeah. Um, so and. Uh, you know scalability. I mean, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Columbus is one city that that has this. Obviously, you go and talk around all the country and everything. So, um, setting up the business format so that that can follow um, and you know get beyond the, the, the confines and walls of Columbus. Yeah. Um, yeah so, so he's doing the social so, justice awards in Cincinnati, yeah. and then we're going to Indianapolis. Right. So, yeah. Follow the same yeah, model. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's how I did 27 cities. Yeah. Uh, Terry, you scaling it and duplicating. Usually our last question, and I know this is a bit off the, the beaten path for how our format normally works, 
But usually our last question is, what can we as a community do for you? You were very vocal about that. I think we all get it, and that's what this is. Oh, no, my bad. So I do want to add that um, just from a One Million Cups perspective, you know, we're a new chapter in Columbus, one of the three newest chapters nationwide. This is exactly what we do it for. And I don't think this type of environment exists. I know Columbus, I'm new to Columbus as well by a year, and I, I've realized just how many organizations there are for startups, entrepreneurs, IBOs, whatever. And and Steve has been challenged to, and he's our lead organizer for the One Million Cups chapter. He started it here uh, in Columbus. We've been challenged to figure out where we fit in, just like you were just saying, where we fit into this big pool of things. And we liken ourselves to be that that front door for people that really just don't have a clue where to go. We're networking, we're doing the road show now with the ultimate goal of getting exposure all the way around. And, and because we're strictly volunteer and we're not uh, otherwise motivated, this is really us doing it out the you know, pureness of our heart, like sincerely. I can't tell you how many times people sign even. So, so when do you make money? Yes. <laughs> right. the business side? There is no business side. Where's the marketing side. dollars? It's putting the networks together. So um, kind of derailed myself there. but. I'm happy that you were able to do this. I'm thankful for you guys coming out so much. And I think this is our niche, is to kind of be that first step and help redirect people into these other areas that kind of fit their lane, right? Mm -hmm. And help them figure out what that lane is. So I do want to offer, for the folks that haven't been here, the opportunity to get a tour of the building, uh, led by Mr. Sonny Martin here. Oh, okay. And he'll, he'll talk a little bit about the vision uh, that we have for this location. I'm assisting in this uh, center from an IT perspective, just helping getting things up. Uh, maybe the AC as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, IT, AC? <laughs> <laughs> IT, AC.